Hello, everyone. So I'm Ais Paspat. I'm at Stanford. And today, I'm going to talk mostly about the work that I've been doing during the last five years in my PhD. Uh, so the main theme of, the, of my research is this natural language interface for web interaction using compositional generation. So just to start up, for the motivation of most of my work, there are two motivations. So the practical motivation side, um, I would like to make an agent that can basically listen to what a human says and then go to the web and then perform some tasks for them. So what kind of tasks? Well, the first one is, OK, suppose I would like to book a travel to Japan, for example. Um, one possible task is to do extraction. So given a sentence like, find recommended place in Osaka, extract all the names of these places from this web page. Uh, the next one, question answering. Suppose I have this kind of a complex structure of a web page just showing a bunch of accommodations for the place I'm going to. I would like to find the cheapest hostel with private bathroom for four. And the last one, suppose I found my place I would like to book. Uh, I say book Usaki House on November 18th for four people. I would like my agent to be able to go in here and then fill out the web form. So in all these tasks, in all these tasks, um, there is a common task structure in all three. So the common task structure here is that we have an environment E and some natural language input X. And we want the model. OK, so here's our decision about the model. We would like it to output some structured output Z. And then by executing that structured output Z on the environment, we'll get something called denotation Y. And here are the concrete um, grounding of those terms. In terms of entity extraction, the environment is a web page. The structured output is the selector, the X path. And then executing that X path would give, give you the list of strings. For UI interaction, the environment is the UI. The structured output is a sequence of actions. And executing the sequence of actions would give you the, um, the return whether the sequence is correct or not in our training scenario. But the main thing that I'm going to talk about today is question answering on web tables. So the setup here is that we have a table from the internet, in this case, some table from Wikipedia, and some structured, uh, some, some natural language utterance, which is a question. We would like to parse it into some logical form. And I'll talk a little bit about how this logical form works later. And this logical form can be executed to get the answer. Here's a real example. This is kind of an abbreviation of this large table. And here's one example question. In what city did this person last first place finish occur? Here are some other questions that, we're in, um, that we are considering. So if you look at these questions that um, we have collected, they are pretty complex. It requires things like comparing between choices, um, doing some computation, counting, and so on. And here's the training paradigm we're going to go in. So we're going to assume that the training data only has the environment, the, the utterance, the, the, the inputs, and then the denotation y, not the structured output z. So the training example would look something like this. The reason why we don't want our training data to have z, there are two reasons. The most common cited reason is that z is hard to annotate. Nobody wants to go in and then annotate those complex logical forms. They have to learn the language of logical form to do so. On the other hand, there is another more subtle reason, which is that we don't want ourselves to restrict uh, the, the formulation of the logical form to whatever z's that we have. Suppose another person wants to come into our data set and then use something like SQL to solve this uh, to solve this problem, and that's good because we have the denotation. They can just use them as string signal as opposed to some sophisticated, uh, some other more arcane logical form that we have. So that's the practical motivation. Now, since we're researchers, um, we'd like to look at the more things that advance the field. So in terms of academic motivation, um, how do we place our work in terms of, uh, in terms of previous work I've been before? So we'd like to look at the work on this kind of thing in two axes. The first one is the size of the domain that we're dealing with. Um, 
starting from closed structure DB with full schema to on the way on the right where we have um, free web, free text, anything goes. On the other axis, we have the task complexity. So the most simple one would be something like extract all telephone numbers from the page. You can use regex, that's very simple. And on the most complex side, we have complex questions that require comparison, aggregation, computational, reasoning, and so on. So here are some plots of the tasks. Some people might not agree with this, but um, I think the most recent addition to this graph since my um, last time I talked about this graph is the one on the top right, which is extractive, reading comprehension, things like squad, where you go to on, uh, on some Wikipedia article and then try to answer the question based on the text. So I think our works is right around that region. So in contrast to qu extractive question answering where you extract some answer from the page, we would like to do a little bit with um, more complex structure that com requires computation. And we think that plain text is not a good place to do that as of, it, as, as of right now. Um, and more semi-structured data like pulling a, table, a random table from the web or some more like listing of products on the web would be a more a better playground for doing such computation. So our work is situated right around there. So here's the outline for the rest of the talk. Um, I sort of uh, yeah, uh, I hide some of the solutions down here, which I will talk about later. But the first part, I will talk about semantic parsing and the problem of exploding space of logical forms. Uh, by the way, if there is any question, please let me know and interrupt. Please feel free to interrupt. So let's dive into the first part, which is semantic parsing. Um, so the setup here, as I've seen before, is to parse the sentence x that the, uh, that the user gave in into a logical form z. So a logical form formulation that we use is lambda DCS introduced by Percy um, a while ago in 2013. And all these work will be a joint work with Percy unless otherwise stated. So how does this logical form thing work? Well, the logical form can be executed on the table in order to get a denotation or the answer. And the answer is usually a cell or a set of cells, but could also be things like numbers. So here's how Z can be executed compositionally. So first, the word uh, first right there grounds to the actual cells with the text first. Applying this relation has position on first would give you all the rows with position first. Applying argmax on the row index would give you the last row. And finally, applying venue off on that would give you the venue of that row. And the answer here is Thailand. So how can we parse the utterance into a logical form? Um, the framework that we are going to use is a floating parser, and it goes like this. First, we have a list of rules. These are called a grammar. These are even though these are handwritten, um, these are written in a way so that it just reflects the syntax of lambda DCS. So basically, for things like argmax, we would need to have some set and some function. And um, our grammar just says that, oh, um, it takes some set and some function. It doesn't have a lot of assumptions about the underlying text or anything like that. So. There is this grammar of lambda DCS that is given to us. Then what can we do with this? The floating parser, OK, so the grammar has two types of rules. And the floating parser uses these two rules to generate a list of possible logical forms. So the first set of rules is the terminal rules. The terminal rules generate the basic parts. For example, in this case, um, there is this rule token spanned to entity type. And this is done using uh, entity linker that looks at the utterance and look at, looks at the table and then extract the um, phrase inside the utterance that match roughly something in the table and then generate a little entity bits of logical form like this. Some terminal rules can be floating, meaning that they can be generated out of thin air without having to ground to anything inside the utterance. 
So in, in our grammar, we allow these relationships, these are the table column headers, to be generated out of thin air. Since there are only things like five to six uh, columns at most, these are relatively few. Then compositional rules compose these two together. So how this rule reads is that you have a relation Z1 and entity Z2, they can combine into a set of has Z1 dot on Z2. So in this case, for example, has position dot first. And then it sort of combined things more. Um, this is applying arcmax and then applying the last relation venue off. So as we can see, these um, bits of relations like venue and position are not grounded to the text at all. So how can we relate them to the text? We, since there is 2015, we use features. Um, we use conjoining features to capture a relationship between the utterance and the logical form. One example feature is where, um, conjoined with the predicate venue off inside the logical form. And we expect that after training, this feature weight should be pretty high because venue off usually um, is pair, should be paired with the word where. And here's how we can train our parser. So our parser, so since we have these features, we can put something, let's say, um, a linear classifier on uh, a linear scorer on this. Um, technically, we can use any other favorite scorer that we want. We can use NeuroNet, for example. Assuming that we have that scorer, what can we do? Um, we first, from the utterance, use our floating parser to generate a bunch of logical forms like this. Then we execute each of them to find which one is consistent with the denotation y. And then do gradient update towards that consistent logical form. So in our formulation, we just use uh, max entropy. And here is the initial result of the system. So in the test set, we get an accuracy of pretty decent, about around 37.1. The same technique could be applied in some other tasks. For example, in the entity extraction problem that we have stated before, uh, we can also treat um, the generation of the expat as kind of like freeform generation that doesn't uh, adhere to the text, and then we execute all of these defined features and then um, try to upweigh the ones with, uh, that gives the right answer. So in this work, uh, the bulk of the paper is mostly spent on how to define good features for capturing sets of entities. So that's for the first part, which is um, the groundwork of semantic parsing. I would like to talk next about what are the challenges that is caused by this framework. So since we have extended the domain size to the full web and extended the question complexity to things like comparison, um, arithmetic computation, and so on, the space of possible logical form is super huge. So here's um, so here is a, a visualization of the set of all possible logic forms. The problem is that at training time, searching for the logical forms that um, give us a correct answer, I'll just call this consistent logical forms, can be pretty time consuming because the consistent logical form is a pretty small subset of the set of all possible logical forms that we can generate. And even if we find all these logical forms that execute to the right answer, some of them are misleading. So how misleading are there? Well, some consistent logical forms can be spurious, meaning that they are consistent for some wrong reason. Going back to our example, this is the correct logical form. And here is a spurious logical form. Um, instead of finding the row with the last index, it finds a row where the time column has the highest number. The time here is the running time of that athlete. It does, it does find the correct row, which is the last row, and find the correct answer, but it doesn't follow what this question is asking. In our schema, we have the, these consistent logical forms. They can be divided into two parts, which are correct logical forms and spurious logical forms. At training time, suppose we are wandering around the region there where there is no consistent logical forms. 
we cannot update a model because we cannot find anything to update toward. On the other hand, if we found spurious logical forms, a lot of them, then we will be ending up updating towards them, which lead to bad update. So with these two challenges in mind, we're going to propose two different solutions in order to deal with them. And the first solution will be to pre-compute the logical forms. What do we mean by that? Well, if searching for the correct logical form at test time, uh, sorry, at training time is time consuming, how about we just don't do that? How about we just pre-process the training data by searching the correct logical forms offline? So what this does is, in effect, converting training data from the ones with denotations to the one with logical forms only. Here's a formal definition of the task. So given an input x, e, and this is pre-processing steps so we have access to the correct denotation y, what we are going to do is we are going to exhaustively generate all the consistent logical forms z's, and then after that, prune out the spurious logical forms from the list that we generate. Clear? OK, so let's dive into the first part which is generating all the consistent logical MCs. In order to do that, we would like to look back at the original algorithm that we use, which is a parser itself. It uses beam search to prune out, to control the size, of, uh, to control the search space, to control the things we're going to look at by pruning out things that, which, had lo which have lower scores. Why is that bad? Well, the space of logical forms grow very fast. It grows exponentially with the size and complexity of Zs. And so beam search drops a lot of parts that are essential for building the consistent or correct logical forms. So that's bad. And thus, beam search will only find a portion of the, correct, uh, of the consistent logical forms. So what can we do with this? Since uh, we made a pretty crucial observation here, which is that even though the space of logical forms grows exponentially, since there are many ways to write logical forms, the space of possible denotations grows much more slowly in terms of our environment of tables. Because the space of denotations are just the list, uh, uh, the list of rows or a list of cells that could be generated by our logic, that are connected somehow by our, uh, our logical form generation, um, or a bunch of numbers, the set of possible denotations grows much more slowly as the, uh, as, as the logical form size increases. So using this intuition, we're going to propose a new technique to search for consistent logical forms, which is called dynamic programming on denotation. The idea here is that we're going to collapse the logical forms that have the same denotation into one meta logical form. And since we have collapsed a lot of logical forms into one method logical form, the search space will be decreased by a lot. Here is one example. Suppose we have these, suppose we have generated these three bits in our generation process. These three bits execute to the same thing, which is the second row inside the table. Suppose we apply the same relation time off to all these three we get the same denotation because execution of logical form is done in a compositional manner. So in here, in dynamic programming on the notations, we're going to collapse all these three logical forms into one meta logical forms that says all these, log all these logical forms execute to the second row inside the table. And here's a full algorithm. So the first part, we are going to collapse these logical forms into meta-logical forms, and then do search on the space of meta-logical forms. This search space is much, much smaller than the original space of possible logical forms. And suppose this is the search graph. Since we're only considering the logical forms that are consistent with our uh, with the annotated denotations, we are going to remove all the paths that leads to things that are not our denotation. In this case, we're removing the right-hand side. And by this removing process, we uh, empirically 
can remove most of the cells from the search part um, up to a uh, usual in in average it removes around 99 percent of the possible cells that we have to search over but these are still the meta logical forms we have to find the actual logical forms so in the second pass we're going to search on the original space of logical forms but restrict the search to the possible paths that we have found in the first pass In order to test out um, how a push works, uh, we're going to do this following experiment. So we grab a bunch of uh, grab a bunch of examples from our training data set, and then we're going to annotate each example with one gold logical form. And we'd like to test whether our DPD algorithm, uh, dynamic programming on the annotations, can generate that uh, can is able to find that gold logical form. So here's our hypothesis, which is that by using beam search, sometimes it could find a gold logical form if it's lucky, uh, and sometimes it cannot find a gold logical form. On the other hand, DPD aims to exhaustively enumerate all the logical forms that are consistent, so it will be able to find a gold logical form more often. And the result is here. On the x-axis, you can interpret that as the beam, beam size, if you prefer. Uh, on the y-axis, that's the number, uh, that's a fraction of correct, uh, of the goal logical forms that we can recover. So some of the goal logical forms we don't have hope to recover at all because they're out of the scope of the grammar that we wrote. For example, if it has to find, um, if it has to extract some substring from the cell, we are not covering that. Or um, if we have to, compare things that are more textual, for example, have to compare the word semi-final to the word final, for example, that's not covered. Uh, we can only compare numbers or dates. So in our result here, we can see that DPD recovers around, uh, recovers 76% of the goal logical forms, while beam search, even though they are initialized with the parameters trained using the training paradigm we have explained before, um, it still fails to find most of the gold logical forms. Question. So usually dynamic programming algorithms come with a guarantee that if the, if the correct answer is reachable, you will find it. Do you have that guarantee? Yes. So in that so the, every case you have. Is that, the, the, that is the complete set of instances where the gold is reachable by your grammar. So there is one big caveat here, which is that um, Okay, apart from that, we only search up to size eight, um, which is that there is one logical form that is super annoying, which is counting where the answer is one. So anytime you have the uh, something with denotation just a single number one, number one can be put in anywhere else, and then that kind of breaks down the system. So we forbid that logical form from being generated, and that reduces the number of things that we can cover by like a uh, one to two percent or something like that. Um, and you have a max length or a max size. Yes, the max size is eight. So that's the first part of exhaustively generating the consistent logical form Cs. In the next part, I'm going to talk about how we can prune out the spurious logical forms from this list. It turns out that if two logical forms execute to the same answer, there's no way that a computer can tell whether one is, well, I mean, you can learn a little bit by um, doing correlation or something like that, but um, if you just have only this one example and you have the same answer for, sorry, the same denotation for two different logical forms, it cannot tell which one is correct but, or which one is incorrect. So instead, we're going to grab some help from humans. So here's the scheme. The intuition here is, suppose, okay, so this is um, the original table, this is the original question, and the annotation in the data set says Thailand, the correct logical forms executes to Thailand, and the spurious logical forms also executes to Thailand. The scheme here is that we're going to shuffle some of the rows in the table. Sorry, some of the cells. After shuffling, we ask the same question. Where did the last first place finish occur? The human would 
some, uh, would change the answer to Finland in this case. The correct logical form since it follows what the question is asking, we'll find the correct answer. For the spurious logical forms with some probability, we'll give you the incorrect answer. So with this in mind, here's how we are going to prune out, a re we call this table with shuffle cells fictitious world. So how can we use fictitious worlds to prune out spurious logical forms? So first we execute uh, the logical forms, just to make sure that um, in the original world we have the same answer Thailand. We generate fictitious worlds and then execute the logical forms on them. We ask human to answer questions based on the fictitious worlds. In this case, um, the answer is Finland. Then we can prune out some of the logical forms that don't agree with humans. We repeat this step on more fictitious tables to prune out more. So in practice, we generated a bunch of tables and then choose five of them to ask humans. And the way we choose five of them is we try to maximize the expected information that we would gain from the human's answers. Um, since the table generation, since the fictitious world generation is not perfect and humans are noisy, um, we actually accidentally pruned the correct logic forms in 20% of the example. This is mostly due to um, the fictitious world being uh, not, I mean, since we're just shuffling the rolls around, sorry, shuffling the cells around, sometimes you can get inconsistent information. Suppose there is a table column, sorry, the table column called total instead of table. The numbers in, say, gold medal, silver medal, bronze medal might not sum up the, to the correct number in the total column. How do you estimate if you prove a correct logical form? I mean, since you don't have the gold and big. Uh, we actually went in and looked at a bunch of examples. So the gold logic forms that we use in to do the experiments in the previous uh, sections is also into play. So we looked whether the gold logical forms has been pruned or not. Um, for the remaining examples, we successfully pruned out 92.1% of the spurious logic forms. Um, since we don't want the correct logical forms to be pruned that much, um, in practice, we, uh, we add a little slack to our pruning algorithm where um, if the logical form doesn't agree with human once, we still allow that logical forms to be inside the list. So we have this list of generated logical forms. How can we use them? Um, well, we didn't have time to do anything with that, but um, there is a fall, there is a, another work by um, Jayan Pradeev, Matt Gardner, which uses 100 shortest logical forms uh, from that we generated uh, to train a neural parser that puts log likelihood objective on the list of those 100 logical forms. And with this, uh, the final test accuracy has become 45.9%. And that's the end of, the, of this section. So we're going to go 180 degrees and talk about a totally different um, approach for tackling the problem of exploding space of logical forms. In this section, I will talk about how we can reuse parts of good logical forms in order to navigate into the better parts of the search space. And the game we're going to play here is patterns. So patterns, what kind of, what, what is patterns? Well, patterns are these things like relation of next to has relation entity that we can extract it from the logical forms that we generated. For example, these two logical forms follow the patterns that I've written above. Why are patterns good? Well, good patterns tend to be, um, good Cs tend to give use, tend to share some useful patterns. And these patterns can be extracted and reused for search in future examples. Another idea about patterns here is that Similar looking inputs, for example, these two utterances, 
will tend to have similar logical forms because they tend to be asking about the same thing but changing the um, details like the entities and relations are lying between. So using these two intuitions, we're going to propose a way to search in the space of logical form more efficiently by using patterns that we extracted from pre previous examples. Um, this is joint work with Yu Shen Zhang and Percy. So in this way, we're going to So here's how it works. So during training, usually we just go through each example one by one, extract a logic list of possible logical forms, and then go to the second question by, uh, but just throw away all the logical forms that we have searched before. After finishing this, um, we go to the next one, throw away all the, uh, all the things we have searched before, and so on. Instead, during training, we are going to um, after we find a consistent logical form, we are going to extract its macro. In this case, um, nation of next to has nation Turkey, we are going to extract this particular macro. Then when a new example come in, we are going to fetch an example that we have processed before with a similar utterance. In this case, for example, who took office right after we are forest, we fetch this sentence. And then we are going to try the macros that are extracted from those example source. So in practice, we fetch around like five utterances and thus five macros. And then we um, try these macros that are extracted first. So sometimes it succeeds. Sometimes it manages to find a consistent, log uh, consistent logical forms, and that's good. We're just going to update towards them. Otherwise, if it fails, we're going to fall back to full beam search and then do beam search. How do you find similar utterances? Uh, this is done by using Levenstein distance. So we look at the sequence. We treat each sentence as a sequence of tokens, and then we compute Levenstein distance. We can imagine some more sophisticated search technique. And since this is during training, um, we can also cache all the distances between any two sentences inside the training data, or find, a, um, say, 100 nearest neighbors in your training data. The result here is that we get 100, sorry, not 100. We get 11x. We get 11x speed up from um, the base, from the base, uh, from the base system that we have before. And accuracy is pretty much roughly the same. So in here, um, by the way, the number is 40.6, whereas before is um, 40, uh, sorry, whereas before is 37. The things that happened between here and then is that we, uh, we added a more sophisticated entity linker that can link to um, entities that are spelled a little bit differently or listed, um, yeah, mostly things that are spelled a little bit differently. And also added a few more um, types of logical form predicates that we can process. So that increases the um, space of possible logic forms that we can generate and thus also increase uh, accuracy in the process. So comparing to the base here, base grammar actually means um, beam search. You can see that the accuracy is roughly the same, but the time used to train and predict are much faster. And using that extended capability of um, extended um, entity linker, adding more rules. Since it's much faster now, we can add more, sophistic more sophisticated rules that we couldn't add in the previous um, system, Sempre 2015, because it was too slow. And our final product here is this macro grammar rule, which has a test accuracy of 43.7%. Um, it's still one of the more pretty competitive single model um, parser that has been uh, worked on this particular data set.
In the next part of the talk, I'm going to touch a little bit on how we can apply the same technique of reusing patterns from previous examples on a totally different task, which is UI interaction. In this work is a joint work with Kevin, Evan, and Tim. The task is the following. Suppose we have this UI um, consisting of, this is a UI of uh, email inbox, and we are given some prompts for um, the agent to perform. We would like our agent to go into this app and then do a bunch of actions listed on the right in order to follow the instructions. Um, and the training data, uh, the training signal that we have comes from two sources. The first is uh, demonstration. So we ask some humans to demonstrate how to do the task on 10 um, instances of this particular UI. And the second is we assume that we have a usual reinforcement learning environment which is just this web UI that generates random tasks for you and then give rewards. So one baseline that we could do here is that we could just um, do RL on the environment directly. Um, since we have some demonstrations, maybe just do um, behavior cloning on the demonstrations first and then um, save them into some replay buffer or whatever and then do RL on top. We're going to propose a different alternative here which is to use the demonstrations to guide exploration doing RL instead of um, just behavior cloning on them and then just save, stash it, or throw it away. How can we do that? Um, so the idea here is that demonstrations work on some utterances that are similar to what we would see during test time. So um, if we follow roughly what people have done during the demonstrations, we might be able to get to the correct reward um, more frequently. And thus, we, have, um, we can update our model more frequently. So how it works. We first convert all the demonstrations that we have into a workflow lattice. This is the first step of the demonstrations. The demonstration clicks on the word fighter, which is in the second box on the right. There are many possible interpretations, which we treat them as patterns. Um, so one possible interpretation is that the user clicked on something that is near the box that has the text that matches the first argument, Lavina. Or maybe the user just clicked on something in the second box. Or maybe the user just clicked on something. Um, so we have many interpretations. Some of them are more vague than the other. And then we put them as arrows inside this lattice. We do this for all the steps. And then at test time, we are given, sorry, at during training, this is all during training time. So at training time, we are given a new environment. We pick a, an abstract workflow by sampling one of these arrows. In this case, I sampled this one. Uh, and for the other steps, I also sample. Then for each of them, we ground them into concrete actions. Some of them are super vague and could match different things on the page. For example, click diff in the last step. So we just sample one possible concrete action that matches that pattern. And finally, execute the whole sequence in, in, order, to get to, uh, in order to get reward. So reward in this case is only just a 0, 1 reward, where the reward of 1 is when you finally get the task correct and zero otherwise. So as you imagine, if you um, explore this space of UI uh, possible actions randomly, there's a good chance that you would get zero all the time and one only once in a, full, one is in a, blue, once in a blue moon. So instead, by following this workflow of um, demonstrated patterns, we, has a, we have a higher chance of getting to the positive reward. So here's uh, little details about how this works out in practice. So in practice, we maintain two different policies. The one on the bottom, the neural policies, is the actual RL policies that um, learns how to do the task. 
based on looking at the, I mean, embedding the environment, embedding the utterance, and then predict actions. Um, but in order to feed that with useful experiences for experience replay, we use a workflow policy. So the workflow policy is essentially just putting a number on each of these arrows inside the workflow. And after executing the workflow, as I've explained in the last few slides, if it succeeds, then the workflow policy will go in and then updates the numbers on the arrows so that the arrows that are uh, that leads to more successful episodes will be sampled more frequently. And here is the result. So on the right, the uh, different shades of blue and green are the works uh, are the baseline models where we use behavior cloning on the demonstrations and then do RL with epsilon greedy exploration on top. So the RL system we use here is A2C. As we can see, even though we crank off the number of demonstrations to a thousand demos, most of them still lags behind our workflow guided, guided explorations, which use only 10 demos for all the tasks listed here. We're at the end of the talk, so I would like to summarize what I've talked. Um, in the first part, I talked about the task of semantic parsing, which is to parse the sentence into some structured output, in this case logical form, in a compositional manner. And the problem that that causes is that with the expanded size of the domain and the expanded size of capability of logical forms, we get the exploding space of logical forms, which leads to because it's logical forms being hard to find and a lot of spurious logical forms. So the first solutions, we propose ways to pre-compute the correct logical forms by collapsing the logical forms with the same denotation into one meta-logical form. And in order to prune out spurious logical forms, we looked at fictitious tables. And in the final part of the talk, I talked about a different approach for dealing with the exploding space of logical forms by using patterns to save up time and looking at only the right region of the search space, search space during training. I also explained how this could be applied to some of our tasks, which is um, the UI interaction task. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.